Hello, Wilkinson here. Today my guest is Bill Marks, and I am in Palm Desert with him at his home. And say hello to my people, Bill. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening <laughs> to all of you. So, I don't know where to start. You're in an interesting life. Why don't you just fill my listeners in on a little bit of your background, who you are and who your family was and stuff like that, because they may not, not all know about you. Well, once again, my name is Bill Marks. I don't know where to end, but I do kind of know where to start. I would say that I led a very fortunate life, which is something that I wish for everyone. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen that way. But I have been blessed all of my life to being able to make choices for myself. Some good, some not so good. But I've lived with both of them, and I'm very happy to say that that leaves me with no regrets for having lived liven <laughs> the long life I've lived, which is I'm going to be 87. That's a rich, long life. What about your family? Tell me a little about growing up. First, I guess I better tell you that I've been a musician almost all of my life. I've been a composer and a pianist for almost all of my life and uh, switching back and forth. And I made my living in the studios in Hollywood, r writing uh, for uh, motion picture scoring and also uh, symphonic writing. It's It's been very, like baseball, it's been very, very good to me. I have lived by the the uh, the belief that uh, my my metaphor is baseball as a matter of fact it's a team sport and it's also an individual sport and it has taught me ever since i was 4 years old and saw bernie uhalt in center field for the hollywood stars that baseball is a kind of the, the 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 shining light in my life. I almost was a baseball player, but I, I didn't have the wheels to sustain myself. So instead, I, I went into the gift that I was given by my birth parents, and that is music. And I've been there ever since. I think I read somewhere you started, what, around age 12, working for your father. Is that true? I started... Uh, arranging music when I was uh, 11 or 12 years old. I had already taken piano lessons, uh -huh. just like so many of you out there. And many of you say to me, God, I wish I had stayed with my piano lessons as you, you know, they've gotten older. Eventually, uh, my piano lessons became less important and and what was more important was my wonderful exposure uh, to things called the 78s and 33s of recordings and i listened to so many things everything from classical to jazz and the fellow that I fell in love with, as far as the piano is concerned, well, there were two, but the first one was very much so Art Tatum, and the second one was George Shearing. And I was always so enamored with them, along with Shostakovich and Stravinsky, Bartok, and uh, a slew of others, uh, that uh, the French Impressionists, and I, I, I kind of carved my personal abilities in music around what I had learned from them, and uh, because they're the ones that resonated in my heart almost more than any, anything else. I, I listened to every kind of music. As a matter of fact, over the years, I have, have not only written music that came out of myself as a result of all of that, but I've also had to write in every single style there was, everything from uh, going back to Mozart's style all the way through to uh, Bartok and uh, 
even uh, uh, Krennic and, and your 12-tone crazies, and uh, which I found fascinating. And so I, I, every kind of country and Western, I, rock, blues, all of it, I've, I've had to because uh, of my uh, uh, responsibilities in the motion picture industry, learning how to write uh, background music for so many different kinds of of, of movies and situations that uh, the movies provided uh, to uh, enhance the, the situation with the music, add add a little something to it. Of all the things you've done in your life, what's been your favorite? Do you have one? Professionally, I would have to say they just recently, it's the last piece I wrote, it's a symphonic work, and it was performed at Disney Hall about a month or two ago for a full orchestra and in honor of my cousin Robert, who had passed on two weeks prior, and to the City of Hope, uh, which is a wonderful organization uh, dedicated to cancer research in the Los Angeles area, Duarte to be exact. That's probably the, the crowning one. It's not my favorite of what I've written, but it's the one that will stick stick with me uh, probably uh, for the rest of my days. But my favorite of all, I think, is writing arrangements for my dad to play on the harp. Mm. And that's those are the ones that uh, I, I think of the most. Just solo harp, not all the orchestral things I've done or the pianistic things I've done. And I must say, uh, in all candor, I enjoy playing the piano, playing a little jazz piano, more than I enjoy composing, but that's that's because I'm kind of a people person, and composing is very solitary, and uh, it takes a lot of time and effort and so forth. So, but uh, I would have to say those two items: the beginning and the end. Um, my dad's arranging uh, for him and his harp. And then this most recent piece of music called Overture for a City of Hope. My listeners may not know who your father was. Who was he? Incidentally, uh, for those of you who are still awake, uh, <laughs> I might add that uh, my father is Harpo Marx. And uh, you can go back to sleep now. <laughs> what was it like? growing up in a famous family? What was it like growing up in a famous family? I think the answer, and I'm paraphrasing it a little, is what my sister Minnie said when she was asked the question, how does it feel to be adopted? And she said, I don't know, how does it feel to not be adopted? <laughs> so uh, my answer, f frankly, is uh, I don't know. I, I, my folks were just mom and dad. Oh, yes, I rubbed elbows with the greats of show business at that time in the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, friends of my dad's that grew up in vaudeville and transitioned into radio and then television motion pictures, and, and uh, so I, I've been around all of that, but I just viewed them as f friends of my dad's, and my dad was just dad, and mom was just mom, and I went through a, a what I would consider to be a pretty normal life. I, I, I was never affected by their fame, and I, I don't know what else to say about it, because that's all I, it's, it's my, my sister said it all. Your folks also were married for a long time. In showbiz, that's kind of unusual. My my 
father was a confirmed bachelor, and my mother was an actress at the time at Paramount, and they met. My mother was 24, my dad was 44, and they were both doing a movie, a different movie, at Paramount. And for four years, my mother uh, chased after my dad, which, frankly, he used to chase after women. But uh, she chased after him, finally nailed him, and they got married when he was 48. She was 28 and uh, lived happily ever after. Uh, he, uh, they had a great 28-year marriage uh, cut short by his passing. And if, they, if he or she were alive today, they'd still be married. It was a perfect, perfect relationship. And there's a book that just came out called Speaking of Harpo. His book was Harpo Speaks, which is a, a f phenomenon in the literary world as one of the top sellers of all time with regard to uh, uh, entertainment history, uh, certainly the turn of the 20th century. Uh, it was all about vaudeville and my dad's growing up and that kind of thing. Uh, well, they, they would still be married and very happily. My mother's book, Speaking of Harpo, uh, has, has come out in, in the last eight months now, doing very well. It's a, it's a lovely book great companion to Harpo Speaks. And then I, of course, wrote a book earlier, not of course, but I did, called <laughs> Son of Harpo Speaks Again, or Speaks, rather. Son of Harpo Speaks. And uh, so we have a trilogy out there now. You can get them on Amazon. Uh, it, and every book, I would have to say mine is the least qualified of the three, but we all have a different take on Harpo Marx, and every single one of them, all three, are nothing but positive. He was a fabulous human being, and I say that unequivocally. Uh, he's kind of, kind of fella, I think the fella upstairs or the lady upstairs had in mind to bring down and make a human out of, it was really something else. He was a great guy. And one of the rare things that you can say about anybody is he died without an enemy, and he did. That sounds like a great legacy. Think about him all the time. The interesting thing about the title of his book, Harpo, Harpo Speaks, is that a lot of people think that he couldn't speak because of his acts that he did. Yeah, Harpo could speak. <laughs> I hear he had a very rich voice. Uh, but he had a, a, a nice bomb he, uh, uh, to his voice. Was was low and down in here and that kind of thing. I once uh, was on the David Letterman show and I explained how it, how he sounded more or less. And I have an audio book out that uh, I I kind of do an impersonation, not an imitation, but it interpretation of his sound, an intimation, I would say. And uh, when he spoke, you listened. But his value to everyone was the fact that he listened. And that's how he got his education, by listening to other people. Are there any favorite stories of you and your father? Any favorite stories? Favorite stories of you two? The two of us? Yeah. I believe... And thinking back, and I'm going way back, is the fact that I was his prop manager, conductor, arranger for 12, 13 years until he passed on. And I did everything with him. I was a, every kind of experience in show business he wound up being uh, on television a lot as a guest artist. And, of course, everybody that is at all in tune with Desi Nar Arnaz and, and Lucille Ball series, I Love Lucy, he was on that, and I was there. 
looking after him. I would say that, uh, incidentally, they colorized it, and it's just beautiful. So if you ever want to see it, it's it's on the top five or six episodes of the 178 that they did. And it's the most uh, requested. I was there, so I would have to say that just my being around my dad and working with him constantly was my great joy. Greatest. How about your siblings? Did you get along with them? Oh, I, I had three unique personalities as siblings. We, we were all adopted, and uh, Alexander was uh, next in line after me. Uh, a, a wonderful young man uh, has since passed on. And uh, my brother Jim, who is doing just fine, he's a fabulous fabulous photographer he studied with Ansel Adams for those of you wow. who may know who Ansel Adams is yeah and he's retired now and that's all he does is uh, photography and it's brilliant and then my sister Minnie who uh, is the love of my life maybe next to my mother she passed on last year and she was just a wonderful influence on Alex and Jim. She kind of ran the show, <laughs> and uh, so then we 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 and we were all very very different personalities, very different, and that's what m makes uh, the world go around, and hopefully, positively. From what you said before. It sounds like you had a great family life, even though your parents were famous, they're celebrities. And then they adopted the four kids, so they actually created this wonderful family. They brought you all together. When I first started this interview with you, uh, I have to say that I think I mentioned that I'm, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I can't tell you how fortunate I am because I can't compare it to any other fortune. I can only say I was blessed by Susan and Harpo, and been grateful all my life through the good and through the bad, but never with them, but uh, through my good and my bad. So I have no regrets about that. And the, the gift of music was given to me by my birth parents who passed on and uh, fortunately, Susan and Arpo found me somewhere. I have no idea. I think it was on the I-10 freeway, or I don't know where I was. But anyway, they they scooped me up, made me Bill Marks, and that's who I am today. Huh. So you learned at an early age that you were adopted? I was adopted when I was 14 months old. Okay. But when did you find out that you were adopted? Did they? Well, when I was about, I, I, I found out I was adopted when I was about four or five, I okay. guess. I don't know. And I... Uh, my dad told me my real name, and, and it didn't seem to affect me at all. I didn't even care what it was. Oh, really? So you but made, the, you made the, no attempt to read your birth no, not, no, but if you read my book, you'll find out how weird, really weird, the circumstances came about that I did find out about them. And uh, not to tip, but I mean, if you guys are interested in in adoption or uh, feeling that it's uh, a, a wonderful thing or that it's a bad thing or whatever, I highly recommend you read Son of Harpo Speaks because I go into it and explain very carefully what I unearthed and I unearthed everything about my my previous, uh, my birth parents. So, uh, it, and, it, and it came about by accident. And just like everybody that's born comes by accident, right? Um, especially in the back seat of a car. Um, <laughs> my dad told me uh, my re my re real last name, and it sounded like I had a disease or something, and I had to go to the hospital to have it taken <laughs> care of. That's all I said. Sounds like I got a disease. You've led a rich life. Do you have any regrets on your life so far? Do you have any regrets? I have no regrets. I think I might have said that earlier. I, I really don't. Uh, uh, if I do, they 
they're sporadic momentarily the moment you you know i wish i had if i'd only uh why didn't i you know those those things come up now and then if you want to call them regrets but in terms of uh my overall picture of my life i only wish for all of you folks out there listening that you find a way to have no regrets because i think that the most important thing in life is is to do the very best you can and if you do the very best you can no matter even if you if you're not well or you're not thinking pro- or whatever you, if you do your best then you'll have no regrets it's when you slough and when you uh fake it uh then you'll find out you'll have regrets sooner or later. But as long as you do the best you can with what you got, and even if it fails, it 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 won't come back to haunt you. It'll make you feel stronger ultimately. And uh, so I have no regrets. One of my next questions was what what makes for a rich life, but I think you kind of answered that. Do you have anything more to say about that? What makes for a rich life? For a rich life. A well-lived life. What makes for a rich life? Belief in yourself, I would say. Uh, Finding, as my dad said, finding something that you love to do and do it until you don't love it anymore and find something else that you love to do. As long as you love doing what you're doing, you'll have no problem at all. And uh, that's a richness that nobody can take away from you. It's just there for you. And I don't know what else to say. Uh, I'm sure luck has a lot to do with enforcing a rich life, but I'm just very grateful that whatever has happened to me, uh, I've done the best I could, and that's where my capabilities begin and end. And as long as I do that, I'll feel pretty good about myself and uh, pretty good about the people that I love and care about. It seems, in my reading, it seems like the Marx Brothers all were in the desert in this area for a while. Is that true? Four of the five Marx Brothers wound up down here in the desert in the Coachella Valley. There was at that time no Rancho Mirage. There was no... Lots of Hiltons and uh, and uh, desert uh, places to go for hotels. There were just a few uh, back in the '40s and the '50s. There, it was an entirely different world than from what it is now. But they chose to be down here to get away from Hollywood, to get away from people, and it's ironic that. Uh, Palm Springs, which is, I think, an iconic name around the globe, it was a place where where people went to get away from people. And now uh, Palm Springs in, encourages people to come down here and to find the stars and the people that are down here, which is the very reason why they <laughs> didn't want anybody to come down here. It's... Uh, it's it's a turnaround, but it's okay. It's but uh, healthy. It, it's the uh, dry heat wherever you go, whatever desert you're in. Dry heat is the healthiest as you get older, and they recognized that. So they all came down and built homes and lived down here for the final years of their life. Have, did you spend most of your life here? Did you you lived in L.A. didn't you for a while? Uh, I basically uh, have been a Los Angelesite uh, most of my life, uh, and it wasn't until 1993 that I came down here. I've been here ever since. I came down to kind of look after my mom, who managed to make it almost to 95 years old, and uh, I've, I've been here ever since. I didn't think I would would like it and when mom passed on in in 2002 i decided to stay i developed new roots down here 
and the people are great, and the, it's a potpourri. You meet a fa fascinating person every day if, if you really want to from different places. They're all people that are, are relocated or just come down for the, the winter because their winter is horrible and ours is lo lovely, and then they go away in the summer uh, like it's 115 out right now. But a fellow by the name of Carrier developed a thing called air conditioning, and so it's really not so bad after all. <laughs> Do you have any advice to my listeners? I have absolutely no advice to any of your listeners. I don't give an, uh, any advice. I do make a suggestion uh, now and then, uh, which is I consider far different. And my suggestion to all of you uh, listening out there is the one that I give myself. Just believe in yourself, love the people that are around you, and and in, enjoy enjoy your life the best you can. It's an up and down world, and but don't let the uh, the pe people wear you down that are not of your of your belief system, which is should always be positive. And that's about all. Just believe in yourself, believe the good in yourself, and pass it on to the next fella or gal or both, whichever comes first. Batteries not included. Well, thank you for letting me come and talk to you today. It's you, been fun, and you're, you're a really fun guy. You're welcome, and thank you. You're doing a nice thing down here. Uh, you uh, relocate, and uh, and I'm, we were, we were really happy that you're out there doing something for, for the uh, people that live down here. It's a wonderful honor to meet you. Thank you, sir. You have a great day. Thank you, but I've already made other plans. <laughs>